Let my love the golden truest Let it sail on silver wing Like a twinkle that's for certain Such a fine thing There's a gathering of spirits There's a festival of friends And we'll take up where we left off Till we all meet Can't explain it Couldn't if I tried How the only thing we carry on Things we hold inside Like a day out in the open Like a love we won't forget Like a laughter that we started And it hasn't died down yet let my love let go, my truest. Let it sail on silver wing. Life's a twinkle that's certain. Such a fine thing. There's a gathering of spirits. There's a festival of friends. And we'll take up where we left off. Just east of Eden, heaven in our mist, and we never really all at far from all the ones we want to miss. Wait out in the water, 
There's a glory all around. The wisest say a thousand ways to kneel and kiss the ground. Bet my love that go my truest. And sail on silver wing lies a twinkle that's for certain. Such a fine thing. There's a gathering of spirits. There's a festival of friends. And we'll take up where we left off when we all meet again. And we'll take up where we left off when we all meet again. Good morning. We have some um, wonderful opening words that were actually, it's an adaptation of something written by one of my clergy colleagues. And you all have a part to play. So Dustin, would you go on gallery? And everyone is invited to unmute themselves. Go ahead and unmute yourselves. And we know there's gonna be a cacophony, but we don't care. And Carol Robinson is here in the house with us and she's going to, um, lead us in the response. And the response is, we are the church. That's your part. So unmute yourself and practice. Let me hear you. We, we are, are the, the church. church. All right, say it loud and it'll be kind of fun. So here we go. <clears throat> we are the single person who's been living in isolation for over a year. We, we are the, the church. church. We're the parents whose children are too young to be vaccinated. We are the church. We are the empty nesters longing for companionship. We are the church. We are the teens not old enough to be vaccinated. We are the church. We are the elders in nursing homes longing for visitors. We, we are, are the church. church. We are the ones who have been resting in place and bursting with energy. We, we are, are the church. church. We are the ones who want to be able to sing together again. We, we are, are the church. church. <laughs> we are the memories of those among us who have died this year. We, we are, are the church. church. We are those who've been double vaxxed and are celebrating <laughs> new freedoms. We, we are, are the church. church. We are the ones who are together here in the building. <coughs> we, we are, are the church. church. We are the ones who are watching online. We, we are, are the, the church. church. We are all the ones committed to building a free faith where no one is left behind. Finally, we, we are, are our church. church. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So now you can unmute yourselves and we will have our chalice lighting. And I'll light the chalice. And Carol, why don't you say all of the words so we don't clunk, clunk into one another here? Super. Wait a second. Let this flame be to us a symbol of the wholeness we seek. Its brightness dispelling gloom, lighting a path to fate and hope. Its glow reminding us of the sacred bonds that link us to all living things. Its radiance calling us to cast the light of freedom, justice and peace upon all the world. Thank you. So again, good morning, everybody. Um, it's so exciting. You know, we really feel like we've come to the end of a lot of the restrictions of the pandemic. We we're actually all in here and we're all been double back. So we don't have our masks with us. And um, Carol can actually, you know, be a worship associate in house. Pretty exciting. So why don't we begin this morning as we uh, have always done. Uh, we will go back to gallery. Dustin, if you'll go back to gallery, you can unmute yourself and wish your neighbors uh, a good morning. Say hello, pass the peace, say hi to one another. We'll spend a few minutes saying hi to one another there in Zoom land. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. 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 Good mor
morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, everyone. Good morning, Pam. Nice Hello. To see you, Mary. Hey, Good, morning. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you. All right. Good to see everybody. And as always, we will have a coffee hour breakout room after worship. So we are making our way towards the end of the worship year. Uh, next weekend is Memorial Day weekend, and Michael Gardner has graciously agreed to um, fill in for me. The weekend after that, the first Sunday of uh June is our annual program meeting, and we really do hope that you can attend that. The, the, there'll be a, a brief worship. This is what we've done for many, many years. A brief worship, 9 to 9.30, and then the meeting will start at 9.30. And it really won't go much past an hour would be my guess. So um, hope you can all attend the annual program meeting. And then uh, we have Carol's actually going to lead worship the Sunday after that. And then the third Sunday of June is our last Sunday. It's Flower Communion Sunday. And we are going to be out on the front lawn. We'll also be broadcasting through Zoom, thanks to the magic of Dustin. He can do that outside. But we're hoping, with if the weather is OK, that we will be together for Flower Communion Sunday for our last Sunday of this church year. Uh, out on the front lawn. There'll be a lot more detail about that later. Um, the Safe Congregations Task Force is meeting Tuesday as it does every other week. And I'm sure we'll think through, you know, there may be an area for folks who are still concerned about social distance and all that. But, um, it, you know, the, the CDC has given us some incredible freedom here and we're, we're gonna figure out how much of that we're, is appropriate for us to take advantage of here at First Parish, but we will be on the front lawn for the third Sunday of June. So that is going to be great. Uh, I wanna call your attention to these really gorgeous flowers. Mary Lynn Carson brought them in this morning and they are to celebrate Lester Lloyd's birthday. So if you happen to see Lester today, be sure and wish him happy birthday. Today is his birthday. And the only other announcement I have, um, is Jim Hamilton here? I don't know whether we have that, uh, whether two board members are going to be available in the um, in the big Zoom room here to uh, chat with folks. I got an email from Jim and I know he was supposed to be uh, organizing that, but something came up. So maybe he is not here. So let's say we will not do that <laughs> uh, for this Sunday. So there won't be that opportunity, but I know there's one more opportunity to meet the board uh, in the large Zoom room. So that's in a couple of weeks. All righty. So we'll begin our worship. Um, the theme uh, for the whole month of May is story. And um, our first video our only video today actually is, uh, I think kind of an interesting take on story. So I hope you enjoy it. How does a camera lens capture truth? We're all interested in truth, right? I'm talking not about a mathematical proof nor a physics account of the universe, nor the rules that govern biology or DNA. This is all, of course, crucially important, but it is not the subject of this reflection. I am talking actually more about the truth that sets us free, what Eric Davis calls poetic truth, or the realm of poetic facts. Early humans sat around the campfire and told stories. Storytelling, it is said, helps us structure and pattern the mind. We can't think about our own thinking without some kind of autobiographical storytelling that contextualizes us as free agents operating in the world. And so we use stories, we use myths to understand ourselves, to gain insight into ourselves. And yet, in empirical terms, myths are fictions. How to reconcile then the fact that something like a myth, like a story, can be 
fiction from the outside, but true from the inside. True in that its lessons are real, its lessons are valuable, its lessons have something objectively important to teach us about ourselves and about the world, right? And thus, they are useful fiction. They are truthful fictions. It's uncanny how this works. The paradoxicality of storytelling, right? You've heard the line that says, sometimes fiction is more truthful than reality. We rely upon novelists to conjure up worlds from their imagination, to exteriorize their flights of fancy, to construct, to concoct worlds of fiction, manufactured realities within which, of course, we can find great truth. This extends as well to cinema, to all forms of art. Cinema is truth 24 times per second, 24 frames per second of truth in the movies. Right? Art is the lie that reveals the truth. This, this, this is fascinating to me. You know, Alan de Botton as well, he says poetry, right? Subjective truth may be less accurate than journalism in describing the details of an event, but may nevertheless reveal truths beyond the literal grid. So the truth of myth, the truth of music, the truth of fiction, the truth of poetry is beyond naive realism. And this is fascinating to me because to account for the human experience, one must account for both sides, right? For science and art, for empirical truth and poetic truth. And Ursula Le Guin tried to reconcile these worlds in her famous idiom, her famous quote that science describes accurately from the outside, but that poetry describes accurately from the inside that science, that objectivity explicates, but that poetry implicates. We both celebrate what they describe. Or that line in Dead Poets Society when Robin Williams tells us, of course, that science, engineering, mathematics, these are noble pursuits necessary to sustain life. But poetry, love, fiction, art, these are the things we stay alive for. Being a aspiring artist and a truth lover and a light chaser, I need to find ways of intermediating, right? Mathematical truth, objective truth with the truth that sets us free. So at the risk of repeating myself, let us together in concert reaffirm that something can be false from the outside the truth from the inside, that there is utility in truthful fiction, that art can be the lie that reveals the truth, and that without music, life would be a mistake. This, my friends, is what I believe. This fuels the work that I do, the content that I make, the songs that I sing, the tightrope that I walk, the line I tow between chaos and order, the flow I find between discipline and surrender. This is how we find our way. This is how all contradictions are reconciled. And this is how we surpass the gods. Yes. Cheers. Good morning. When Reverend Catherine asked me to put on my historical committee hat and talk briefly about people of color in our congregation's history, I have to admit to an overwhelming impulse to get up announce history of people of color in First Parish Church of Duxbury, 
maintain a few moments of uncomfortable silence, and then just grab my papers and, and, and sit down. It's not that such history doesn't exist, however. It's just that the earlier church historians didn't address it. So there's a little more digging to be done. The historical committee, in fact, has been working on this topic for at least four years. Black history and indigenous history are permanent agenda, item, agenda items at our monthly meetings. We have a regular column, History Matters, in the bell ringer that gives us an outlet to share our research with you. Uh, a shout out here to Cindy Wilson. I think I saw you in the participants list, uh, who has been particularly active in this regard. If you go back to your February bell ringer, you'll find an article that Cindy wrote on abolition and slavery. And in April, she wrote an article on Duxbury's Women's Anti-Slavery Society that had 50 members, uh, including uh, and probably leading the charge, uh, Sally Bradford and her four uh, daughters. Cindy has also written a new article uh, for, for the June issue of, of the Bell Ringer, this time for the Racial Justice uh, Task Force on the New Guinea settlement parting ways uh, and the four black revolutionary war soldiers who settled there. So look for that. With the time allotted this morning, I'd like to get started on rem remedying this omission of people of color in how we tell our story by starting at the very beginning and describing slavery as it was practiced in Duxbury from the 1620s to about 1783, when it was abolished by court order in Massachusetts. From the earliest years of colonization, slaves of African or origin did indeed wind up right here in New England, even if only one or two per household. But to get the full picture, it's important to realize and this may be new to you as it was to me, that Native Americans were also enslaved by the colonists. Natives considered troublesome, that is those who committed a crime, were shipped off to the West Indies. The pace of human trafficking picked up after the defeat of Metacomet and his coalition of tribes in King Philip's War in, in, seven, in, seven, in 1676 when warriors were rounded up and sent into slavery in the islands, often in exchange for black slaves. So there was this back and forth of Indian slaves for black slaves. The native women left behind were also sold into slavery, usually as household domestics. To be clear, these were Wampanoag, Narragansett, and other Massachusetts nat native peoples, Duxbury's neighbors at the time. But you might ask, in, in the colonial years in Duxbury, were there really slaves and slave owners? Yes and yes. We owe a huge debt to a young Duxburyite Justin Windsor, barely out of, his, out of his teens when he published History of the Town of Duxbury in 1849. He scoured the early records and interviewed townspeople, leaving us a treasure trove of information. The term Negro uh, comes up 11 times in his manuscript. Um, I was able to retrieve it in PDF form uh, from the Library of Con Congress and, and was able to, to search. So I, I, I think it would be helpful uh, to you to hear some of these entries in Justin Windsor's own words. First of all, in a section on, uh, one of the first sections of the book is on biograph biographies of uh, important townspeople. This is part of one about Constance Southworth as, as related by uh, one of his descendants, Edward Southworth. So Constant, who died in 1833, 
um, the, the story is that his house in Duxbury was burned down by the carelessness of his Negro who unintentionally set it on fire with a candle when he returned home late in the evening and that Mr. Southworth was county registrar and all the records were burned therein. Now the early records of the town of Duxbury did burn in a house fire. Uh, Justin seems, doesn't seem to be convinced that all of the details match, but there is a possibility that, that this is a story uh, that explains the loss of those records. Um, later on in that same section, he has, does a little description of, of the possessions that people had in their, in their farms. And he's talking about the livestock, a couple of horses, oxen, cows, sheep, and swine. Several orchards were planted at an early date by the settlers. And then he just goes on to say, some of them owned slaves, which was not uncommon and even to a comparatively late period. Samuel Seabury, Barry, uh, who died in 1681, mentions in his will his Negro ser servants, Nimrod, who was to be sold, and Jane, whom he gave to his wife. And then he says other instances can be named. And then later on, um, there's a, an, an entry about Samuel Seabury's estate after he died. And, and he mentions Nimrod and Jane again. Um, let's see. I will give that my Negro servant Nimrod, val valued at 27 pounds, be disposed of either by hire or sale in order to the bringing up of my children, especially the youngest three now born. Uh, so he was going to use the proceeds for the education of his children. And then as far as Jane is concerned, he, he mentions his uh, daughter Elizabeth, who probably removed from the town as in her town's will, she has given her a Negro girl, Jane, and a cow, if she returns. Other entries, this is in a footnote, it's not part of the um, ma major part of the text. At a later period, John, Colonel John Alden owned a Negro slave named Hampshire who was married June, April 16th, 1718 to Mary Jones, an Indian woman. Lieutenant Thomas Loring, who died in 1717, left three Negroes valued at a hundred pounds. And his son Thomas owned a Negro man, Bill, alias William Fortune, whom it appears by the records he determined on uh, December 1st, 1739, to free from the yoke of servitude and bondage for divers good and valuable reasons and causes and considerations after the first day of May, 1752. So he said he was going to do that in 1739. It, it is not supposed to happen until 1752. Uh, let's see. One more, I, I have now before me, this is Justin writing in the first person, dated 1741, given by John Cooper of Plymouth to George Partridge, no less, of Duxbury. Not sure which George that is because there are a number of them in, it, in the history of the town. Conveying to him a Negro man named Dick, aged about 23 years of middling statue, stature. And the last piece of this is, Indians who have been convicted of certain crimes were condemned to be sold as slaves in the early times of the colony, as well as those who had been captured in war. A rather unpardonable offense in the opinion of the philanthropists of the present day. So he's writing in 1849. So you can see a, sh a shift in public opinion um, from uh, the earlier times to the time approaching the Civil War. And there's more, but it's, I think it speaks, the, I think it speaks for itself. It's chilling reading. I found this matter of fact, 
completely dry, matter of fact, account of human bondage, deeply disturbing. And for the record, it's safe to, safe to assume that all of the slave owners just named were congregants of First Parish Duxbury, or First Congregational Society, as it was called in the early years. That's just the way it worked in those pre-separation of church and state days, when church attendance was mandatory. So this is indeed part of our history, like it or not. It's quite likely that, that free and formerly enslaved people of color attended services at our third meeting house built in 1785 and torn down in 1840 to make way for our current fourth meeting house. Our clue is the third meeting house pew plan. You don't have to see this in, in, in detail, but I, I, can, I can show you just a little bit. Let me see if I can put this so I can get myself oriented. This is the upper gallery. They're seating on the first floor too. And in the pulpit is up on at the top. And at the bottom is, is, the, um, is seating around the, the outside part of the gallery. In the far back corners are, uh, are sections labeled colored men and colored women. Now, the third meeting house opened in 1875, two years after slavery was abolished. So you no longer have, I, I, I would love to get my hands on the uh, two plan of the second meeting house and see if there's any indication there. But at least we know that as late as, as uh, the years immediately after the Revolutionary War, there was accommodation for people of color. Um, when I look at the plan and see how these seats are arranged, I have to wonder if the people sitting there can either be seen or can see the pulpit, pulpit because I think that the, the, the area is sunk behind tiered seating. So it's an interesting, interesting piece. So to Nimrod, Jane, Mary Jones, Bill, Dick, and many nameless others who were enslaved here in Duxbury, we call you into our sacred circle this morning to acknowledge your full humanity we mourn with you the loss of all that was dear, freedom, family, future. May we resolve today to do everything in our power to dismantle the systems of, re of oppression begun with your enslavement so that your descendants may fully enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in our nation, communities, and our church. And may we commit to telling the whole story, the good, the bad, and the ugly. As, as the video said, uh, the truth will out and it will stand on its own. May your memory be blessed. May it be so, amen. There's a fiction in the space between Lines on a page Memory, write it down But it doesn't mean You're just not telling There's a fiction in the space between You and reality You would do anything to make 
Your everyday life seems less undone. There's a fiction in the space between you and me. There's a fiction in the space between you and me, a fabrication grand scheme. I'm a scary monster. Need to say it as I leave the sea. In my spaceship, I am laughing. Yeah, your remembrance of a bad dream. There's no one. To be standing Feel the pity and the pain For the ones who do not speak Back the words you give respect and compassion For prosperity Spread the words and make there's a truth in the space between There's a fiction in the space between You and everybody Give us what we need Give us one more sad story Sometimes a lie is the best thing Is the best thing I'm going to tell you a story, a true story about an incident that happened 100 years ago this week. Over the course of an 18 hour period from May 31st to June 1st, 1921, a white mob attacked residents, homes and businesses in the predominantly black uh, Greenwood neighborhood of Tulsa, Oklahoma. The event remains one of the worst incidents of racial violence in our history, in US history and for a period of time remained one of the least known uh, incidents of racial injustice. By 1921, Tulsa was a growing prosperous city with a population of more than 100,000 people, but crime rates were high and um, vigilante justice was common. Tulsa was also a highly segregated city at the time, and most of the city's 10,000 black residents lived in a neighborhood called Greenwood. And this neighborhood had thriving businesses and there was so much uh, commerce that it was often referred to as the Black Wall Street. On May 30th, 1921, a young black teenager named Dickie Rowland entered into an elevator in one of the office buildings on the main street. And at some point after that, the young white elevator operator, a young girl named Sarah Page, let out a scream Dickie fled the scene, the police were called, and the next morning they arrested Dickie. By the, that time, rumors of what supposedly had happened in that elevator circulated all throughout the city. And on the front page of the Tulsa Tribune that afternoon, there was a report that police had arrested Dickie for sexually assaulting the young white woman. As evening fell, an angry white mob was gathering outside the courthouse, demanding that the sheriff hand over Dickey. The sheriff refused and his men barricaded the top floor to protect the black teenager. Around nine o'clock that night, a group of about 25 black men and mostly World War I veterans came to the courthouse to see if they could offer some help in guarding Dickey. After the sheriff turned them away, some of the white mob returned 
with rumors still flying of a possible lynching, a group of around 75 armed black men came back to the courthouse an hour later where they were met by 1,500 white men, most of whom were carrying all kinds of weapons. After shots were fired and chaos broke out, the outnumbered group of black men returned to Greenwood. Over the next several hours, groups of white Tulsans, some of them who were deputized and given weapons by city officials, they committed numerous acts of violence against black people, including shooting one unarmed man in a movie theater. The false belief that a large scale insurrection among black Tulsans was underway seemed to fuel the growing hysteria. And as dawn broke on June 1st, thousands of white citizens poured into the Greenwood district, looting and burning homes and businesses over an area of 35 city blocks. Firefighters who arrived to help out to put out the fires later would testify that rioters had threatened them with guns and forced them to leave. According to the Red Cross, the estimate was some 1,200 homes were burned and 215 other homes were looted. Two newspapers, a school, a library, a hospital, churches, hotels, stores, and many other black owned businesses were totally demolished. By the time the National Guard arrived and the governor uh, instituted martial law, the riot had effectively ended. Though guardsmen helped put out the fires, they also imprisoned many black Tulsans. So by the next day, June 2nd, some 6,000 black Tulsans were under armed guard at the local fairgrounds. In the hours after the Tulsa race massacre, as it was known, all charges against Dickey were dropped. Seem the police concluded that Dickey had most likely stepped on the young girl's foot and that caused her to let out a scream. Dickie Rowland left Tulsa the next day and reportedly never returned. In the years beyond, as Black Tulsans worked to rebuild their ruined homes and businesses, segregation in the city only increased and Oklahoma's newly established branch of the KKK grew in strength. For decades, there were no public ceremonies or memorials for the dead or any efforts at all to commemorate the events of, of the Black Massacre. Instead, there was a deliberate event, uh, attempt to cover them up. The Tulsa Tribune removed the front page story that had allegedly sparked the chaos. And scholars later discovered that police and state militia archives about the riot were missing as well. As a result, until recently, the Tulsa race massacre was rarely mentioned in history books, never taught in schools, never really talked about at all. Until this past week. This past Wednesday in the Washington DC, the House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties heard testimony from the three known black survivors all of whom are over 100. They were children at the time of the event. I watched as Viola Ford Fletcher, 107 years old, gave her testimony saying she still remembered seeing the black men being shot in bodies in the street. She was, as I say, seven at the time. In her words, I still see black men being shot, black bodies lying in the street. I still smell smoke and see fire. I still see black businesses being burned. I still hear airplanes flying overhead. I hear the screams. I have lived through that massacre every day of my life. And one of the other survivors testified with these words. I have survived 100 years of painful memories and losses. I have survived to tell this story. I believe that I am still here to share it with you, she said to the congressmen and women. Hopefully, now you will all listen to us while we are still here. My spiritual friends, I wanna pause for a moment 
just a moment. And I invite you to think about how you felt, what rose up in you when you heard that story. So let's take a moment in shared reflection. I know how it felt for me in telling it, telling that story to you all. As I said earlier, the, state, uh, the churchwide theme for this month is story. And this morning, the invitation is to reflect more deeply on the power of story, the power of every single story, the power of one story. My friends, the fourth principle of our Unitarian tradition, U -U -U tradition affirms our free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Truth and meaning really do depend on one another. But so often, my friends, the only stories we hear or we know or we tell are not all true stories. Either they're stories that are blatantly false, or most of the time they are stories of history with lots of omitted parts, missed hurry. Stories that are omitted from the canons of our history as we teach about our nation, about our community, about our church. These stories we've been told or that we tell ourselves about the world, they have power. James Baldwin once wrote this, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. But facing the truth of our history as a nation or even as a gathered community of faith, can be painful and long, hard work. But as my idol, Dr. Ibram Kendi says, it is the beginning of the work that we must do in order to dismantle systemic racism. I was thinking this week about a, a very incomplete or an, ac an accurate version of American history that I was taught as a kid in history class. I was taught that when American slavery ended, white supremacy or any kind of racism in America also ended. But the truth is different, isn't it, my friends? The truth is that long after the Civil War, right up to the 21st century, many white Americans continue to carry the same set of white supremacist beliefs that govern thought and action during the times of slavery. Share cropping and convict leasing controlled black labor in the late 19th century. Jim Crow legislation regulated black behavior in the early 20th century. And then there's the racial terror to police the color line that we're experiencing in the 21st century. Slavery's legacy is white supremacy. When we gather the stories like the Tulsa race massacre, we can see that the ideology which rationalized bondage for 250 years has justified the discrimination, the discriminatory treatment of people of color for the 150 years since that civil war ended. The belief that black people are less than white people has made segregated schools acceptable, mass incarceration possible, and police violence permissible. And for far too long, policymakers have fixated on fixing black people instead of trying to undo the discriminatory systems and structures that have resulted in separate and unequal education, voter suppression, health disparities, and an immense wealth gap. My spiritual friends, essentially slavery continues to affect black Americans and influence present day domestic policy in everything from urban planning to healthcare. I saw Dr. Fauci make these remarks yesterday or the day before he said, he talked about the truth of the undeniable, these are his words, the undeniable effects of racism have led to unacceptable health disparities that especially hurt Afri uh, African Americans, Hispanics, and Native Americans during the pandemic. As he put it, 
COVID-19 has shown a bright light on our own society's failings. My spiritual friends, as hard as the work is, we need to excavate those buried stories like the story of the Tulsa race massacre and the story of slaveholders in our own community and church. We need to brush those stories off. We need to hold them up to the light and we need to find their meaning and their use. We need to bear witness to these stories in our nation and in our community, not from a place of shame, but from a place of hope and liberation and justice. We need to ask how can these stories help us all become repairers of the breach in our society? And I'd like to close with two readings that I, I find have guided me in my own truth telling. And the first reading is by my colleague, the Reverend Jan Carlson Bull. Once a body of belief begins to crack, once what is held to be historic gospel begins to erode, once any of us becomes privy to another story, another history, another reality, we tend to cling to the familiar only out of a need to be reassured, only out of a penchant to take our cues from loved and respected teachers and preachers and touted authorities on this or that. Because climbing onto a boat guaranteed to rock is sometimes just too scary. But conversations matter. Stories new to us, but ancient to others, they matter. Histories written or recalled across the generations from a different lineage, they matter. A religion that holds faith and doubt in reverent balance and that insists on the search for truth in its highest, that religion, our religion, it matters. And the second reading is by Tanahisi Coates. A few months ago, he wrote this really long piece in the Atlantic about reparations, and this is drawn from that piece. What is needed is an airing of family secrets a settling with old ghosts. What is needed is a healing of the American psyche and the banishment of white guilt. What I'm talking about is more than recompense for fat past injustices, more than a handout or a payoff or a hush money or a reluctant bribe. What I'm talking about is a national reckoning that would lead to spiritual renewal. Reparations would mean the end of scarfing down hot dogs on the 4th of July while denying the facts of our heritage. Reparations would mean the end of yelling patriotism while waving a Confederate flag. Reparations would mean a revolution of the American consciousness, a reconciling of our self image as the great democratizer with the actual facts of our history. An America that asks what it owes its most vulnerable citizens is an improved and humane and more just America. May it be so someday, my friends. Amen. May the hearts not be hard for the living on the margin there is room at the table for everyone this is where it all begins this is how we gather in there is room at the table for everyone Long that we have wandered, burden and undone. But there is room at the table for everyone. Let us sing the new world in. This is how it all begins. There is room at the table for everyone. 
There is room for us all, and no gift is too small. There is room at the table for everyone. There's enough if we share. Come on, pull up a chair. There is room at the table for everyone. There is room at the table for everyone here and now. We can be beloved community. There is room at the table for everyone. There is room for us all, and no gift is too small. There is room at the table for. Everyone, there's enough if we share. Come on, pull up a chair. There is room at the table for everyone. There is room at the table for everyone. That is dancing music. <laughs> Until we meet again, my friends, may you be blessed and now be a blessing to the world. And we have our uh, breakout room coffee hour and enjoy this absolute gift of a day. See you next time.